The following presentation is distributed by Lighthouse Catholic Media, a not-for-profit corporation. To order additional copies of this presentation, browse our selection of over 300 inspiring titles in English and Spanish, make a tax-deductible donation to support the free distribution of these CDs, or receive more information on becoming a Lighthouse Catholic Media account manager to help answer the Holy Father's call for a new evangelization. Please visit our website at www.lighthousecatholicmedia.org or call us toll-free at 866-526-2151. Craig Turner began his career in journalism in the 1980s, covering Capitol Hill, where he worked in both communications and public relations. He is a columnist syndicated through Griffin Communications and a business owner in the Washington, D.C. area. His articles reach more than 5,000 newspapers in North America and have been posted by MSNBC, Business Week, and Reuters. His two books, Words of Faith and Works of Hope, are available through St. Benedict Press. He resides in Burke, Virginia with his wife and children. And now, here's Craig Turner. Our amazing story begins in 1509, on the outskirts of the Aztec Empire, the most powerful empire to have existed in antiquity in the Western Hemisphere. Princess Pompensen, an Aztec noble and the sister to Montezuma, fell seriously ill and then died. Princess Pompensen was given an elaborate funeral and then buried on the grounds of her palace. After her burial, she was found alive again, near the burial chamber where she had been buried. Her subjects were terrified until she spoke to them, ordering that they bring her brother, Montezuma, to see her. When he arrives, she tells Montezuma that while she was dead, she was taken on an amazing journey. She says, I found myself on a seemingly unending plain. In the center of the plain I saw a road that forked ahead in several paths. Near the road there was a river with a strong, tumultuous, and frightening current. I thought about swimming across the river when a tall young man stopped me. He was wearing a long tunic, white as snow in winter. His whole body was as bright as the sunlight. Pompenson then describes a mark on the forehead of the man made of light. On his forehead, she says, was a cross, and she demonstrates to her brother by putting two fingers together, one horizontally, the other across it vertically. Then she continues, taking my hand in his, he said, stop my child, for the time for you to cross the river has not yet arrived. God loves you, although you don't know him. Walking by the river, she says, I saw lots of skulls and bones of dead people and heard cries so sorrowful that my heart filled with pain. Her guide says to her, the cries you hear are those of the souls of your ancestors that are paying for the wrongdoing and will continue paying for eternity. She says, casting my eyes on the river's current, I saw great ships and in them men of different color and clothing. They were white and bearded, had banners in their hands and helmets on their heads. Painted across the sail on at least one of these ships, she sees a large cross that matches the symbol on the forehead of her guide. Her guide then says, those ships you see approaching belong to men who by force will destroy and rule this kingdom. They will bring with them the knowledge of the true God, creator of heaven and earth. He then says that after the coming war, the people will be given a sacred bath that will restore their souls and have their misdeeds erased. You, he says, will be the first to receive this sacred bath. And with your example, you must guide the rest of the nation. After this dialogue and experience with a mysterious guide, Pompensen is returned to her body, and her body miraculously comes alive again. Montezuma listens to this story in horror, because he's a man who believes in both omens and the supernatural. After they part company, he never speaks to his sister again, awaiting the day when giant ships will arrive from beyond the great waters to conquer his kingdom. Ten years later, on Good Friday, April 22, 1519, Hernán Cortés lands on the coast of present-day Mexico with 508 soldiers on 11 ships, 100 sailors, 16 horses, as well as cannons, crossbows, and artillery. He names the place where he lands Veracruz, the True Cross. Two days later, on Easter Sunday, Mass is said for the crew, one of the first Masses to be said on the mainland of the New World. 
In order to discourage any mutiny or rebellion, Cortes burns 10 of his 11 ships in the harbor. Cortes meets with the local inhabitants and requests to be taken to the ruler of the Aztecs, but he's refused. So he leaves 100 men in Veracruz and marches inland in August of 1519 to Tenochtitlan with more than 500 men, 15 horses, some cannons and hundreds of indigenous warriors that he has befriended from the outskirts of the Aztec Empire. Meanwhile, a courier has run across the causeway that separates the island capital from the mainland and arrives in Tenochtitlan carrying a large shiny object for the Aztec emperor to see. To Montezuma's great fear and astonishment, he's handed a large metal helmet with a black cross branded across the front. When Cortes crosses the causeway into Tenochtitlan, he's greeted by Montezuma and accepted as an honored guest and nobleman. He and his men are housed in the palace of Montezuma's father. According to Aztec legend, the great feathered serpent god, Quetzalcoatl, would return one day, and so Montezuma believes Cortes is either an emissary of the feathered serpent god or Quetzalcoatl himself. Montezuma is eager for his new guests to leave and decides to furnish them with presents in order to hasten their departure. So he offers them lavish gifts of gold carried by 100 porters. Among these gifts were the following, a room full of breastplates and shields of gold and silver, necklaces of jade set in gold, scepters studded with precious stones, gold rings, golden bells, statues in solid gold of jaguars, monkeys, and armadillos, as well as items such as artistic blankets and quilts, elaborate headdresses with feathers, and Aztec books made of bark. Cortes sends his treasure back to the ship to be transported to Spain. And when his ship arrived secretly in Cuba on its way back to Spain, one witness later said, there was no other ballast than gold. Rather than encouraging the Spaniards to leave, however, the gold only increased their appetite. But the prospect of obtaining gold was not the only factor keeping them in Tenochtitlan. Despite the fact that they were being treated as royalty and housed in a palace, the Spaniards were agitated and distressed. To their great horror, they are awakened every morning to the shrieks and screams of human sacrifice that are being carried out atop pyramids and are being performed in unspeakable numbers. These sacrifices took place by the thousands by the Aztecs. Hearts were torn from their victims whose bodies were rolled down the sides of pyramids. And when the corpses reached the ground, they were ceremonially cannibalized. This, it was believed, gave the sun god its power to rise again and cross the sky. The more sacrifices that were offered, the more powerful the sun god became. 100,000 skulls hung on only one skull rack in the Aztec camp. Chroniclers recorded that Tlacalel, one of the Aztec leaders in the latter days of the empire, sacrificed as many as 80,000 people in a period of only four days in 1487. One of the four main Aztec gods was Quetzalcoatl. His name meant feathered serpent, and he was the god of the wind. This was the god that Montezuma believed may have returned in large ships, powered by the wind in the person of Cortes. Another important deity was Tonansin. She was a goddess who had a special chamber for worship atop the Great Pyramid in Tenochtitlan, next to the deity of war. She was a very demanding goddess who exhibited very little mercy. Human sacrifice was used to appease her wrath and make her happy. She was the goddess of sustenance, as well as the goddess of human fertility and childbirth. Tonansin was known as Snake, and her main temple was atop Tepeyac Hill, six miles north of Tenochtitlan. Despite Cortez's demands, Montezuma would not cease the sacrifices. So only a week after arriving, and though he was completely outnumbered by the Aztecs, Cortez places Montezuma under house arrest and confines the Aztec ruler to his palace. Cortez then climbs the stairs of the main temple, ordered the priests to remove the symbols of the Aztec gods, and places a cross and an image of the Virgin Mary in their place. To complete the change, Holy Mass is celebrated on the premises. Meanwhile, the governor of Cuba, the man who actually ordered Cortes to go to the coastland, has changed his mind about the conquistador. They didn't have a very good relationship in the first place, and decides he is going to send someone to arrest Cortes and bring him back in chains. His charge against Cortes is disobedience to previous orders, and he picks his old friend, 
Panfilo de Narvaez, to carry out the arrest. Narvaez soon becomes central to our story. With 1,100 men, Narvaez lands on the coast, but his journey is not such a fortunate one. One ship sinks in a storm, and worse, 60 people who are put ashore before arriving at their destination are massacred within weeks by local natives. And even more goes wrong. After the ships have landed at the destination, Aztec lookouts spot the landing party, make a drawing of 18 vessels, 15 of which have wrecked on the beach, and they run it inland to inform Matazuma. Narvaez moves inland and sets up his artillery at the top of the pyramids at Sempoayan. Cortes hears about the landing and decides he needs to first defeat Narvaez before he tries to capture the Aztecs. So he leaves 200 men in Tenochtitlan and then returns to the coast with the remainder, probably less than 350 men. Cortes is very shrewd. He knows that with such inferior numbers, an army one quarter the size of the Narvaez army. He needs some sort of advantage. So armed with bags of gold, he sends spies into the Narvaez camp. These men move about very quietly, secretly talking with the artillery officers to whom they give bags of gold. One artilleryman is given 1,000 pesos to block cannons with wax at the time of the battle. Other spies carry letters to each of Narvaez's captains and officers, offering them 20,000 castellanos if they will join Cortez. Narvaez learns of the treachery and quickly assembles his troops. He's got no gold to offer his men or anything of value for that matter. So he tells them that all who remain faithful to him will receive positions of importance after the conflict. In most instances, it seems that his offer of a change in title doesn't compare to the bags of gold that his officers now hold. When the battle commences, Narvaez has the upper hand. He has both the higher ground, a necessity, as well as far superior numbers. History has shown that Cortez, even when outnumbered, was a shrewd tactician and fierce warrior. Narvaez's cannons, however, which are stationed atop pyramids, don't seem to work right. His crossbowmen, stationed on the main pyramid, have an excellent trajectory and every advantage. But Cortez's men are resilient and manage to begin an ascent of the main pyramid where Narvaez is stationed. They wield pikes with blades and possess crossbows, some of which are very effective. Over the course of hours of combat, they slowly ascend the pyramid, and one of Cortez's crossbowmen manages to send a flaming arrow into the thatched building at the top of the pyramid, setting it ablaze. As night falls, with the blazing inferno as background of the battle, the arrows run out and hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensues. Cortez's men wield pikes with blades. Narvaez's men, only 30 of them are left now, defend him at the top of the pyramid, brandishing swords and pikes. Suddenly, one of Cortez's men, armed with a pole with a blade at the end, jams the blade into Narvaez's eye and gouges it out. There is a tremendous shriek of pain as Narvaez buckles over, unable to defend himself. Narvaez, now crippled and in agony, surrenders to Cortez. Narvaez himself is taken captive and imprisoned in a nearby temple. He spends two years in Veracruz in chains and then is sent back to Cuba, but is eventually pardoned by Cortez. After the Battle of Sempoayan, Cortez returns to Tenochtitlan, but it takes another year for him to conquer the city. Montezuma dies in the process, stoned to death by his own people. But in 1521, Cortez captures the new ruler of the Aztecs and destroys Tenochtitlan. Our story now turns to this man named Narvaez. He returns from Cuba to Spain in the summer of 1525 to friends and relatives who urge him to retire. He was by all accounts, however, an ambitious man. Rather than retire, he gets an idea. A promising new land has been discovered in the new world called Florida, and he decides that what this land needs is a governor. Narvaez wants to become the first governor of Florida, an enormous tract of land stretching from the Atlantic Ocean across the southern United States and into present-day Mexico. So he presents his idea to the king of Spain, nearly begging for the opportunity to be the governor. The king makes Narvaez not only the governor of Florida, but grants him the titles of Captain General, Civilian Authority, Superintendent of Fortresses, and a host of other titles. Narvaez then buys five ships that are capable of carrying 600 passengers. He sends out a crier through the town to advertise the venture. 
a boy to walk through the city screaming out the advertisement. Among the people who step forward is a man named Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. He's the oldest son of six orphans from southern Spain and a veteran of the Spanish military. He spent 15 years in the military, is currently in his mid-30s, fairly slender, and is in good health. Because he had a good record with the military, he is appointed number two in command of the Narvaez expedition. He's made the royal treasurer, which means he will oversee all economic transactions. He will take orders directly from Narvaez. Also hired into the expedition is a man in his mid-twenties named Andres Dorantes. Dorantes, originally raised in a poor family in southern Spain, is made captain of the infantry, an important position for an expedition such as this one. He is granted considerable power and authority as the captain of the infantry, and would have been looked up to by the soldiers and crew. Also on the expedition is Dorante's slave, Estevanico. Very little is known about Estevanico. Even his physical appearance is unknown. But he was known as a kind of spirited and curious black Arabic-speaking man who was originally from a coastal town in Morocco. In 1513, he was captured along with other townspeople when a Portuguese armada carrying a young Ferdinand Magellan on board go to the town and take slaves. Estevanico is taken back to Spain and sold as a slave. While in Spain, he converts to Christianity, hence the Christian name Stephen, in Spanish, Estevanico. Neither his date of birth nor his original Arabic name is known. Also on board is Captain Alonso del Castillo. He was a native of the Spanish university town of Salamanca and was the son of a doctor. Both his parents were members of the Spanish nobility. He would have had an easy life if he had remained in Spain as an hidalgo, a person of the nobility who owns property in some wealth. But even though he is a timid man, Castillo chooses the adventure of traveling to the New World, and so he sells a portion of his estate in Salamanca to buy arms and supplies and become a partner in the expedition as a captain. All four of these men were considered to be pious. There is no record that they were exceptionally religious for their time period, nor is there any indication that they were less pious than their contemporaries. It is possible that Castillo, from the Spanish upper class, may have grown up in a large home that possessed the private chapel adorned with icons, statues, and tapestries. Finally, five Franciscan friars are recruited to tend to the spiritual needs of the crew and to serve as missionaries to the natives. The leader, Fray Juan Suarez, was appointed Bishop of Florida and would assume spiritual command of this new province. This journey was his second to the New World. His first, sometime around 1524, was with the first group of 12 Franciscan missionaries who were sent to evangelize the natives of Mexico. With the exception of another of the Franciscans who had been with Suarez on that original journey to Mexico, little is known about the other friars. When the ship is finally prepared, an extraordinary event occurs. A woman who is to ride as a passenger on the ship speaks a prophecy to Cabeza de Vaca. She says in no uncertain terms that this journey will end in terrible disaster. There will be, she says, a great tragedy that will befall the journey. No one will survive the conquest on land, she tells him, insinuating that if anyone does survive, it would be a miracle. She goes on to prophesy other things about the journey, all of which come true over time. Cabeza de Vaca is unsure what to think of this woman's premonition. Upper class people, as well as leaders such as he on a large journey across the ocean, would have looked down upon the lower class paying passengers. Their opinions were hardly respected, and a premonition about future events that have yet to occur would also have raised doubts in the mind of a person such as Cabeza de Vaca. It's possible he looked upon it simply as a curiosity. Nevertheless, the woman who gives the prophecy is adamant, absolutely sure that everything she is saying will come to pass. Finally, the ship sets sail, crossing the Atlantic and landing on the island of Hispaniola. They stay for a month and a half, but during that period of time, 140 men desert the expedition. Part of the reason this happens is that Hispaniola was going through a pearl rush, a sort of gold rush for the Caribbean. There was an enormous frenzy of people trying to get rich on pearls. Canoes would go out into the ocean carrying slave divers with them. Divers would dive overboard with large stones fastened to them and sink 50 feet to the bottom of the sea. 
Then they would untie the stones, swim and gather up as many pearls as possible, and then swim to the surface, dumping them into the canoes. 26,000 pounds of pearls per year were being obtained only in one area during this time. Nearly all of it was taken back to Spain and sold, making a tremendous amount of money for those involved. Well, Narvaez has to hire more people, which he does, mostly locals. After he finishes his hiring spree, they sail from Hispaniola to Cuba. Their intent is to go to the southern coast of Cuba, around the western tip, and across the north coast, heading east to Havana, which has already been established by this point in time. It's like traveling clockwise from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock around the island. After picking up supplies, they'll leave Havana and travel directly west to the coast of Mexico, where there's a town called Panuco. Panuco is the staging area for the entire conquest of the northern coast of Mexico below Texas. So it's a very important place and figures prominently in this story. Now, there are many different sources for this journey so far, including historical records of the Spaniards' encounters with the Native Americans. From this point forward, however, the one source that all books and accounts refer to is the report that Cabeza de Vaca writes to the King of Spain upon his return to civilization. It's about 80 pages long, is called the Relacion, and describes in detail his harrowing journey every step of the way. I rely directly upon the Relacion for the information in this account. While the Spaniards are still on the southern side of Cuba, they pull into a really bad port and drop anchor in order to go inland three miles to get more supplies. Cabeza de Vaca and some of the crew go inland, but the weather turns bad. And it turns so ferociously bad that nothing less than a major hurricane strikes. Here's what Cabeza de Vaca wrote about this encounter with the hurricane. At this time, the sea and the storm began to swell so much that there was no less tempest in the town than at sea, because all the houses and churches blew down, and it was necessary for us to band together in groups of seven or eight men, our arms locked with one another, in order to save ourselves from being carried away from the wind. We were as fearful of being killed by walking under the trees as among the houses, since the storm was so great that even the trees, like the houses, fell. In this great storm, we walked all night without finding an area or place where we could be safe for even half an hour. When the storm finally dies down, the people in the town rush to the beach in search of the ships, but they don't find any. So they begin to walk the beaches to see if they can find any signs of either the ships or survivors. The first sign they come across is a skiff that's found resting in the tops of some trees. They ultimately learn that both ships have sunk all 60 men have perished and are never seen again, and all supplies, as well as 20 horses, are gone. The remaining ships from their party that don't stay in that port did make it through the hurricane, and after a rendezvous, the remaining crew decide that they'll stay on Cuba for the winter and resume their journey in the spring. It's an interesting footnote to history that in the wake of two terrible hurricanes in the early 1500s, Hispaniola residents had set out to protect themselves by building churches endowed with large crosses, one early chronicler explains, Devout Christians affirm and experience has shown that after the most holy sacrament has been placed in the churches and monasteries and other towns of this island, the hurricanes have ceased. The best interpretation is that the hurricanes didn't actually cease in the Caribbean, but what could have happened is that once the townspeople brought in the blessed sacrament and put crosses at the tops of the churches and the monasteries, they were given some kind of divine protection from the devastation of the hurricanes that would pass through. In the spring, they resume their journey, but they get stuck for two weeks off the coast of Cuba on a shoal. Just as they are running out of fresh water and getting desperate, their boats are lifted by an unusually high surge in the water level. Set free, they sail for Havana, but as they're approaching the city along the northern coast of Cuba, they're only 40 miles away at this point, a great southern wind suddenly picks up and blows them out to sea. Those ships are designed to tack and should be able to travel in almost any direction through the sea. For some reason, they're unable to control the direction of their ships. After a month of sailing through unknown waters, Cabeza de Vaca and his crew finally hit land, what is today the western coast of the state of Florida. Before we assume that the Spaniards are completely incompetent, it's important to note that the Gulf Stream, which is very powerful and was very little understood at the time, is recognized today as the most powerful current in the world. It's equivalent to 2,000 Mississippi rivers, all traveling in one direction up to 100 miles a day. 
Part of the problem for the Spaniards is that they're battling against the Gulf Stream. They didn't know this. In fact, when Ponce de Leon sailed through the Gulf Stream, he was startled to find that he was moving backwards, even though his ship had a favorable wind. Two of his ships on that journey close to shore had to drop anchor just to stay in place. And a third ship that couldn't drop anchor was carried out of sight. Incidentally, on this same journey in 1513, Ponce de Leon landed near Cape Canaveral, Florida on Easter Sunday, what they referred to at the time as the Flowery Festival. The Flowery Festival in Spanish is called Pascua, Florida. So he named this new land where they had landed La Florida. Unfortunately for the Spaniards, they don't know where they are. They were supposed to travel directly west to Panico on the coast of Mexico, but they actually went north. The first sign that there's something really wrong is that the sun should be rising over water instead of over land. What they find instead is that the sun is rising over land and setting over water. It's a complete mystery to them. The pilots that they had hired back in Hispaniola tell the Spaniards that they know this area even though they really didn't and that they are only 30 to 45 miles away from Panuco, directly down the coast. In reality, they were 1,800 miles away. To picture their predicament, envision the Gulf of Mexico on a map like a giant clock. They were supposed to travel from the center of the clock directly west to the nine o'clock position where Panuco lay. Instead, they traveled almost to the one o'clock position to the western coast of Florida, a place that didn't exist on any map at the time. It turns out it's Holy Thursday, 1528. A few of the crew would disembark and go ashore onto Florida and they meet some Indians. This meeting could very well have been called the first Thanksgiving. The Indians traded fish and venison to the Spaniards who traded back small trinkets that they had packed on the journey for trading. Then the two parties went their separate ways, the Spaniards returning to their ship. The following day, Good Friday, they go ashore again and send out another scouting party. On Easter Monday, the day after Easter, the scouting party discovers Tampa Bay. It is the most remarkable bay for ships that the Spaniards had ever seen. When the scouting party returns, still unsure of their location or the exact distance to Panico, they begin to realize they need a plan of action. Narvaez decides that since the pilots hired men who claim to know the area, have said that they are very close to Panuco, all they really need to do is march overland, sticking to the coast, and they'll hit Panuco in 30 to 45 miles. It shouldn't be very hard, and the distance is not great. Even so, they are still at a loss as to why the sun has been rising over the land and setting over water. Cabeza de Vaca, number two in command, vehemently disagrees with Narvaez and strongly recommends that they stay with the ships. One of the main problems that Cabeza de Vaca recognizes is that of the 80 horses, only about half of them had survived the crossing and were still alive, 42 in all. And these 42 horses are weak, feeble, and hardly worth using as help on the journey. Most of them could hardly stand. In addition, the people themselves are hungry and tired. The disagreement turns into a heated argument, but in the end, Narvaez overrules him and decides definitively that they'll take the remainder of the crew and soldiers, 300 of them, and continue the journey on land. The paying passengers and those who were brought as civilians can go back to Cuba. Suddenly, a very interesting thing happens. As they're preparing to reload the ships with the passengers and crew, the woman who had given the prophecy to Cabeza de Vaca back in Spain speaks up again a second time. This time, not only is Cabeza de Vaca present to hear her, but Narvaez and the crew are as well. Cabeza de Vaca later wrote, she had prophesied to the governor many things that later actually befell him. She warned him before he plunged inland not to go, that he nor anyone with him could ever escape. Though should one get back, the Almighty must work great wonders for him. She, however, believed few or none would ever be seen again. The governor said that after all, he and his men were going to fight and conquer wholly unknown nations, and that of course, he knew this would cost many slain. But the survivors would indeed be fortunate for what he understood of the riches of that land. Yet he begged her to tell him where she had gotten her notions of what was going to happen, and that was in the past, as well as these things still to come. And she replied that this had been told her in Castile by a Moorish woman. She had said the same things to us even before we left Spain. So the passengers are reloaded and the ship set sail and the remaining 300 begin their march along the beach heading north and west. Quickly they find, however, 
that there are great obstacles to their journey. One of them is that the land is covered with rivers, which poses a great problem since only about half of the 300 can swim. Getting across a river is difficult, and each time they encounter one, they have to build a canoe and ferry anywhere from 150 to 300 people across. So it's a tremendous amount of work, and it takes an entire day just to cross a single river. Well, they continue walking through Florida, following the coast, and as they get close to the panhandle of Florida, they begin to run out of food. They've been surviving on oysters collected out of the bays, but they number 300 men, so there's hardly enough oysters to go around. Even though they had seen animals along the way, bears, panthers, armadillos, there's no record that they had hunted these or any other animals in order to stay alive. Just as odd is that they never saw an alligator or a crocodile in their entire march through Florida. No historian knows why they wouldn't have spotted even one, since it has always been thought that both alligators and crocodiles are indigenous to that region. The oysters are not really helping their situation very much because the people begin to get sick. Their sickness is probably malaria and dysentery combined. They become so sick that before too long, very few are even able to stand and about one third of the entire party, 100 people, are close to death. Completely desperate, the cavalry plots to desert. They decide that their only means of survival is to desert the expedition and fend for themselves. But just as they're hatching this plot, Narvaez finds out, in those days, being caught as a deserter would have gotten you the death penalty. But Narvaez himself is terribly sick as well, and he can't even stand up. He's so sick, he hardly has the energy to solve this crisis, let alone impose a death penalty on the would-be deserters. So rather than discipline the cavalry or impose a death penalty, he calls everyone together in a large meeting to solicit opinions about how to proceed. Despite the fact that they are all sick, another problem for them is that the Indians, some of whom ambush them from time to time on their journey, are very cunning and strong. They have bows that are five feet long and can shoot arrows at great speed. The Spaniards are amazed to find that the Indians can fire their arrows 200 yards with accuracy. Loaded with these obstacles, Narvaez listens to different opinions. Nobody knows exactly what to do, but a plan seems to form that would involve building boats to sail in. Cabeza de Vaca wrote later, considering our experience, our prospects, and various plans we finally concluded to undertake the formidable project of constructing vessels to float away in. This appeared impossible since none of us knew how to build ships and we had no tools, iron, forge, oak, pitch, or rigging, or any of the indispensable items or anybody to instruct us. Worse still, we had no food to sustain workers. They solved the food problem by deciding they'll kill a horse every third day and cook it to feed the troops. In addition, they can make forays into Indian villages to steal corn, which they do with great success, since in the end they net about 100 bushels of corn from Indian villages. They also foraged for shellfish in bays. They begin to build the five large barges to hold all the survivors on the journey, even though they only have one person with any carpentry skills. For the boards, they cut down trees. The pitch they made from pine resin. They made caulk from twisted husks and fibers of palmettos and then ropes and rigging they made from tails and manes of horses. The oars they made from juniper wood, sails they made from pulling the shirts off the backs and stitching them together, and then the ballast and the anchors they made from local stones. They made water bottles by taking the flayed horse leg skins, stitching those together, and using them to hold water. During this time, 40 men die of disease and hunger, and even more die from Indian attacks. By the time they're done, all the horses have been consumed. Even though they're out of food, they have five barges, each about 32 feet long, and able to carry 40 to 50 men crowded together like sardines. Cabeza de Vaca wrote, when clothing and supplies were loaded, the sides of the barges remained hardly a foot above water, and we were jammed in too tight to move. Such is the power of necessity that we should hazard a turbulent sea, none of us knowing anything about navigation. When the Spaniards shove off, they leave behind the remains of a camp that 12 years later, Hernan de Soto discovers. When de Soto lands, he comes across the exact camp where Cabeza de Vaca and his men had been. He sees scattered charcoal, as well as the hollowed out logs that were used for water troughs. Unfortunately, the barges are barely seaworthy. 
and the Spaniards try to sail them along the coast going west toward Mexico. When they get close to what is the Florida-Alabama border, a large storm overtakes them. So they anchor off the coast and stand there in the freezing cold rain, waiting for the storm to pass. But it's completely miserable. They have no food left. They've run out of water because the bags that they had made with the horse skins have rotted. They've got no place to lie down and sleep, nor do they even have shirts on their backs since they were used to make the sails. In addition, it's freezing cold. The one consolation is that they can get water by turning their heads up to the sky and collecting water in their mouths. But perhaps the worst part is that they've got no bathroom. So they stand there in these barges, half naked in a huge storm, freezing cold, with slop down at the bottom of the barges and their feet getting wet for six straight days. And they just stand there waiting for the storm to end. It's hard to fathom such a situation. The five Franciscan friars standing in the comptroller's raft are the only ones on the journey to have taken vows of poverty. But even with such a vow, the emptiness and deprivation would have been almost unbearable. Finally, the storm ends and suffering from malnutrition, weight loss, and hyperthermia, they resume their journey along the coast. They are trying to avoid the Indians because the encounters are rarely good. In one Indian attack, every person, including Cabeza de Vaca, gets injured. Then, just as they begin to die of dehydration, an amazing thing happens. As they're heading west, they suddenly happen upon a torrential river coming off the continent. It's so powerful that suddenly they're pushed out to sea. The meeting with the mighty Mississippi River is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that now they can take their cups and dip them right into the ocean and put them to their lips and drink fresh water. They were astonished at the amount of water coming off the land. Nobody had ever seen a river this big before. The Amazon had yet to be discovered, and the Nile, while it does produce more water, pours out into the Mediterranean across an enormous delta. The Mississippi dwarfed anything a European had ever encountered. The curse, however, was that they were pushed out to sea. They had wanted to stay by the coast where they would be able to find food like oysters and small game. But this huge current pushes them out to sea and the rafts separate. They try to stay together, but it's impossible given the current and the force of the moving water. Cabeza de Vaca yells out to Narvaez and says, please throw us a line so that we can stay together. We will wrap our barges together. But the governor turns around and yells back to Cabeza de Vaca, I think not. At this point, it is every man for himself. And he leaves the others in hope of getting to shore himself. At this point, the rafts have separated and they've lost sight of land. During the next few days, the men begin to collapse. Cabeza de Vaca writes this, It was winter and bitterly cold, and we had suffered hunger and the heavy beating of the waves for many days. Next, the men began to collapse. By sunset, all in my barge had fallen over one on another close to death. Few were any longer conscious. Not five could stand. When night fell, only the navigator and I remained to tend the barge. Two hours after dark, he told me I must take over. He believed he was going to die that night. The following morning, just as they have lost hope, they hear the sound of waves breaking and suddenly their raft is thrown 42 feet ashore onto Galveston Island. Cabeza de Vaca and the men on his raft crawl ashore freezing and emaciated. They make a fire and cook their last little bit of corn they possess. Then suddenly 200 Indians show up in their camp. At this point, there were only six men who were even able to stand, so the Indians could have slaughtered them quickly. It would have been no contest. But by signs, they pledge friendship and then go away. The next day the Indians show up again bringing food, both fish and roots, which they share with the Spaniards. These meetings and encounters go on for several more days until Cabeza de Vaca decides to try to relaunch the raft and continue the journey. So they take off all their clothes and put everything they've got in a pile in the middle of the raft. All they possess is in the center of the raft and stark naked, they push the raft out into water. As they're trying to paddle out to sea though, a large wave comes, flips the raft, swamps it, and the raft sinks to the bottom. Tragically, as the raft goes down along with all their possessions, three men sink to the bottom as well and drown. The Spaniards are desperate and inconsolable at this point. They crawl back to shore, wailing and crying. 
and return to the remains of their camp. They then rekindle the fire and proceed to sit around the fire, bawling their eyes out. Just at this moment, the Indians return with food for the evening, and they see this very strange sight. The newcomers they see are all sitting around a fire, but now they're completely naked and acting very strange. The Indians keep their distance out of fear, but then the Spaniards call them forward and explain by signs exactly what's happened. So the Indians proceed to sit down next to the Spaniards, and they too begin to wail and cry as well. And the group cries and cries and cries. This strange scene continues for some time until Cabeza de Vaca turns to the Indians and asks by signs, can we go to your huts? The Indians talk about it and agree. It's so cold, they know the Spaniards won't survive the walk to their camp. So they build four bonfires on the way to their village and take the Spaniards to the first bonfire to let them warm themselves. Then they go down the path to the next bonfire and let them warm themselves there. Cabeza de Vaca writes, at each fire, when we regained a little warmth and strength, they took us on so swiftly, our feet hardly touched the ground. When they finally get to the village, they are taken to a very large hut with many fires on the inside. It's warm and comfortable on the inside, and big festivities begin with dancing and celebrations that go on all night. The Spaniards are fairly convinced that this is their end. They believe they're going to be cannibalized in the morning. But to their surprise, when morning comes, they're given food and treated well. Though they are fed, the Spaniards are not granted any clothing. And in fact, throughout the rest of the journey, Cabeza de Vaca remains completely naked. While Cabeza de Vaca is living with the Indians on Galveston, something very unusual happens. The Indians approach him and tell him that some of the members of their tribe are sick and need to be cured by the Spaniards. Cabeza de Vaca, unschooled in medicine and not believing he has any special powers, says essentially, we don't have any power to do this. But the Indians more or less reply, surely you do, you're extraordinary men, you must have this power. But he flat out refuses to try. The Indians are so insistent that finally they withhold food from him and his companions. He finally gives in, writing later in his report, hunger forced us to obey. So the Spaniards go to the sick Indians and pray over them. Cabeza de Vaca says, bless the sick, breathe upon them, recite an Our Father and the Hail Mary, and pray earnestly to God our Lord for their recovery. Following this short set of prayers, they conclude by making the sign of the cross over the sick people. And lo and behold, these people begin to get well. The Indians suddenly are cured of their illnesses, and in jubilation, the Indians begin to celebrate. Even though they were pious men, the Spaniards are just as shocked as anyone at the instantaneous recovery of the sick Indians. Giving the credit to God and not to any power that he or his companions might possess, Cabeza de Vaca states, He, God, willed that they had been restored to health. In consequence, the Indians treated us kindly. They deprived themselves of food to give to us and presented us skins and other tokens of gratitude. Their work as healers goes on for some time and they are treated very well, but unfortunately, Cabeza de Vaca and some of the others get very, very sick. He's so sick, he probably can't even stand. And as a consequence, the Indians then suddenly demote the Spaniards from medicine man status to slaves. They're made slaves of the Indian tribe. There's only 14 Spaniards left alive at this point, because the others have died off as a result of disease and hunger. And Cabeza de Vaca writes that life became unbearable. Their life among the Indians is horrible, and they survive as slaves with a tribe trying to pull out roots from the bay. Their fingers even bled as they worked. Finally, in February of 1530, he decides he's going to flee inland to escape the slavery. It was a very fortunate decision. He escapes the island and flees inland, but it's extremely difficult because there are no food sources. So to survive, he becomes a traveling merchant, moving about from tribe to tribe selling items he's carrying and making trades. He takes some of the wares he's got from the coast and he goes inland with them to trade. From the coast, he takes sea snails, conchs that are used as knives, sea beads, mesquite beans that are used for medicine and ritual beverages. And he takes them inland and trades for skins that are used for various purposes, including clothing, canes that are used for arrows, flint for arrowheads, sinews that are used to make string, 
deer hair, and then red ochre that is used to paint faces. He becomes well known among the Indians in the eastern part of Texas and prospers in this business. He goes from Galveston north through the Houston area and all the way up to present-day Dallas, and possibly, historians think, as far as Oklahoma, and then back again. And he wanders up and down the eastern half of Texas, supplying Indians with goods that they don't possess in their region. He writes, Wherever I went, the Indians treated me honorably and gave me food because they liked my commodities. The reason he flourished in this capacity is because the Indians, wary of each other and sometimes at war with neighboring tribes, rarely traded goods. So Cabezi de Vaca became the perfect intermediary salesman for all the tribes in the area. He works in this capacity for two years, and though he was able to make a living and stay alive, it wasn't always easy. He says, the hardships I endured during this journeying business were long to tell. Peril and privation, storms and frost, which often overtook me alone in the wilderness. By the unfailing grace of God our Lord, I came forth from them all. This final remark is one of the first comments made by the explorer in his report he later sends to the king that he has undergone a kind of religious conversion. He gives up his work as a wandering merchant, is still desperately trying to get back to Panico, and one day bumps into Durantes, Castillo, and Estevanico, living with an Indian tribe in central Texas, somewhere near San Antonio. The tribe, actually three tribes, the Camones, Mariames, and Iguaces Indians, are very, very poor. Famine is constant and they'll eat anything, including spiders, worms, lizards, venomous snakes, earth and wood, and, says Cabeza de Vaca, anything including deer dung and other matter I omit. They're so poor and hungry that only two or three times a year do they even feel full. In addition, they are cruel and sadistic masters, treating everyone, including their own children, with contempt and abuse. Cabeza de Vaca joins them in order to be back with his companions, and he remains with them long enough for the four to decide that they'll make an escape from captivity once again. So they escape into the woods one day, surviving on acorns from trees as their food. Finally, after some time, they run into the Avavari's Indians. These Indians had heard of the Spaniards through other groups and quickly accept them into their tribe. On the evening of the first day, the Avavaris approached the Spaniards and asked them to be cured of terrible migraine headaches that they had suffered for some time. Castillo, the son of the doctor in Spain, goes to them, but rather than attempting to offer any kind of medicinal application or salve, he instead makes a sign of the cross over each one of them and commends them to God with a prayer. As simple as this formula sounds, it was all that was needed for a series of miracles. Lo and behold, one by one the Indians are healed of this painful malady. Migraines that had nearly incapacitated so many of them were suddenly and miraculously healed by a simple prayer and benediction. When Castillo is done after offering this prayer and blessing, the Indians begin to cheer and celebrate, and suddenly there's dancing and singing that lasts not just until sunrise the next day, but for three full days. The Spaniards are more than overjoyed as well, and quickly decide to spend the winter with the Avavaris Indians. During this winter, with the Avavares, something very interesting happens to Cabeza de Vaca. While the tribe is out foraging for food in a forest, Cabeza de Vaca gets separated from them. He can't find the Avavares or the other Spaniards anywhere, and as night falls, it gets very cold. It is so cold, he knows he will freeze to death without any fire to keep him warm. He's got no food, he's got no shelter, and he's got no clothing, and has no ability to make a fire. And suddenly, as he's walking through the woods, still looking for the tribe, he sees a single tree in the forest burning. It's not a forest fire or any area that is scorched or the remains of a fire pit. It's an actual tree on fire. He's astonished as he looks at it, approaches the tree, and finds that it's just a single tree alone in the woods blazing. He has no idea how the tree caught fire, and there is nothing nearby to give a clue why the tree would be ablaze. So he lays down next to the tree and spends the cold winter night bathed in an orange glow. The next morning, still alive, he fashions a bundle of wood and puts it on his back, takes a burning branch from the tree, and he spends the day wandering through the area looking for the Avavari's Indians. But he can't find them anywhere. So in the evening, in order to stay alive, he digs a small shallow hole in the ground, 
and he makes four fires in the form of a cross, one near his head, another near his feet, and one at either side of him. Lying on the ground in the midst of these fires, he survives to the following day. And then he goes off in search of the Indians again, but he can't find them anywhere. For five days, he searches for the Avavaris and his companions while carrying a torch through the woods. He writes, All this while I tasted not a mouthful of food, nor found anything to eat. My bare feet bled. But by the mercy of God, the wind did not blow from the north the whole time, or I would have died. On the fifth day, he stumbles into the Indians and is saved. And the Indians, Spaniards, and Cabeza de Vaca all celebrate with great rejoicing. The following morning, five people ask Castillo for healing from abdominal illnesses. In a manner similar to his previous ceremony, Castillo blesses them and commends them to God with a prayer. And suddenly the Indians find that they're cured. Cabeza de Vaca writes that they were bestowed health so bountifully that every patient got up the next morning as sound and strong as if he had never had an illness. The following day, Castillo is asked by the Susulas Indians, a neighboring tribe, to heal their people. The report from the messenger from the Susulas indicates that there's one person who is wounded, some who are sick, and one person at the point of death. Castillo, who is a very timid person, says he doesn't want to go and refuses to help. So Cabeza de Vaca decides he'll go instead with Durantes and Estebanico. When they arrive at the village, they find that one particular man who was at the point of death is actually already dead. He's got no pulse, his eyes have rolled up in his head, and he is covered with a mat. In fact, he had been dead so long that the tribe had already dismantled his house to be burned, the custom among those Indians. So Cabeza de Vaca writes, Taking off the mat that covered him, I supplicated our Lord in his behalf and on behalf of the rest who ailed as fervently as I could. He blesses the dead man and breathes on him many times, but nothing happens. The man is as dead as dead can be. So Cabeza de Vaca rises and finds the others that need to be cured. He prays over them, cures them, and leaves the tribe. That evening, a messenger runs into the Abavari's camp, panting and with astonishing news. The dead man came back to life. The messenger goes on to tell them that after the Spaniards had left, the dead man awoke, rose from his spot, and was as alive as any other person in the camp. He continued saying that the man walked around amongst them, ate food, and spoke with the others in the tribe. In fact, everyone that Cabeza de Vaca prayed over recovered and was made perfectly well. Cabeza de Vaca writes, Throughout the land, the effect was of profound wonder and fear. People talked about nothing else. Wherever the fame of it reached, people set out to find us, so we should cure them and bless their children. With no exceptions, every patient told us that he had been made well. Confidence in our administrations as infallible extended to a belief that none could die while we remained among them. Now the question arises, how or why did these men receive the gift of healing? Why did they go from ordinary men, ordinary men in unusual circumstances as slaves and wanderers, to those possessing such an exalted gift? The answer lies hidden in the fact that the soul that remains faithful to God through tragic and devastating circumstances can receive extraordinary charisms. In fact, to reach supernatural transformation, a person must first be put through a severe trial, either physical or spiritual or both, that tests them in their faith and often pushes them to the breaking point. If they humble themselves through these trials and continue to practice virtues, God will exalt them. Saint John of the Cross, who lived in Spain at the same time as Cabeza de Vaca, wrote about the soul's journey toward total union with God. John of the Cross was one of the great mystics of the 16th century, and he possessed extraordinary gifts. Witnesses saw him levitate while in prayer, for example. His fellow Carmelite friars were so used to seeing him levitate that toward the end of his life, they hardly paid attention to these episodes. His brother testified at his canonization that he saw John of the Cross more than once levitating while walking in fields of grass. On another occasion, when the future saint was praying, he was lifted up so high, witnesses said they saw his head almost touching the ceiling of the chapel. After he died, a brilliant light radiated from his body and his face became transfigured. Witnesses also saw three rings, like halos over his head, and his body never decayed after he died, remaining incorrupt, like he's lying in his casket sleeping. 
One of John of the Cross's great works, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, is a kind of manual about how a soul achieves perfect union with God. He explains that above all, it requires that the soul become completely and totally emptied to the point of actually feeling annihilated. In chapter 7 of book 2 of this work, he writes, True spirituality seeks for God's sake what is distasteful rather than what is delectable, and it inclines itself rather to suffering than to consolation. The soul that practices this suffering and is brought to nothing will achieve all that other spiritual practices can achieve and even more. So any spirituality that desires to walk in sweetness and with ease and flees from the following of Christ's example is worthless. In the same way, when at last a spiritual person is reduced to nothing, spiritual union will be brought about between the soul and God. If there is any lesson to be learned from the long and extraordinary journey of Cabeza de Vaca and his companions, it's what John of the Cross wrote, that to achieve union with God, one must not only accept hardships and deprivation, but that person must be reduced to nothing. So as the Spaniards travel through Texas, their fame increases and thousands of Indians begin to follow them from tribe to tribe. At the same time, they encounter cultures and hear stories from the natives that are astonishing. One of them in particular is worth recounting. The story of Mr. Bad Thing, La Mala Cosa, which from Spanish is translated as Mr. Bad Thing, is the name of an evil spirit that the Indians of the area had seen and witnessed themselves. He was described as a little man with a beard who wandered through the district. Strangely, no one could see his features distinctly. Sometimes he dressed as a man, sometimes as a woman. When he appeared, he appeared as a brilliant light on the other side of the door of a hut, as if he was like a blazing brand. After the brilliant light appeared, Mr. Bad Thing would rush in, seize a victim, deeply gash the victim in his side with a very sharp flint, and then thrust his hand in, sometimes pulling out entrails. He would gash the victim's arm three times, the second one on the inside of the elbow, and he would sometimes even sever the limbs of his victims. He also could heal the wounds he had created, and in the process, would perform an ecstatic dance amongst the people. He always refused food, and when asked where he came from, the Indians said he pointed to a crevice in the ground and said his home was there below. The Spaniards, trained in theology, inform the Indians exactly who this evil spirit is. Cabeza de Vaca says, we told them he was an evil one, and as best we could taught them that if they would believe in God our Lord and become Christians like us, they need never fear him, nor would he dare come and inflict those wounds again. The Spaniards continue on their journey, first in a general westerly direction through Texas into New Mexico, then continuing west into present-day Arizona and eventually turning south down into Mexico. Everywhere they go, they are followed by thousands of Indians of multiple Indian tribes. One evening, they are housed in a lodge as 12 Indian warriors stand as sentries to guard the travelers throughout the night. As they go, they cure everyone who comes to them with an ailment. Among the many amazing cures they perform was to a man who had had for a long time a very large arrowhead lodged inside his chest from a bow shot through the back. Gabezi de Vaca cut the arrowhead out through the man's chest using a knife, soaking himself and the patient with blood. But the following day, not only was the man completely well and experiencing no pain, the incision itself, which was a gaping wound the previous day, was now only a crease the size of a line across a man's palm. Cabezi de Vaca said that these cures, quote, so inflated our fame all over the region that the Indians believed we could control whatever the inhabitants cherished. The Spaniards come to realize that their ministry is due in large part to the fact that they had become emptied and reduced to nothing. So like most saints before them, they voluntarily stay empty and adopt a sort of permanent fast. We traveled all day without food, wrote Cabezi de Vaca eating only at night, and then so little as to astonish our escort. We never felt tired. The Indians, for their part, would not eat food until it had been blessed by one of the four Spaniards, even if they were very hungry, and no one would drink anything except with permission. In addition to curing the natives, the Spaniards tell the different warring tribes that to be allowed to follow them, they must first cease hostilities with their neighbors and forgive whatever injuries or conflicts they have had in the past. The Indians, reluctant at times to do this, ultimately comply. Through all these nations, Cabeza de Vaca wrote later, 
The people who were at war quickly made up, so that they could come meet us with everything they possessed. Thus we left all the land in peace, and we taught all the people by signs, which they understood, that in heaven was a man we called God, who had created the heavens and the earth, that all good came from him, and that we worshipped and obeyed him, and called him our Lord, and if they did the same, all would be well with them. In early 1536, after a journey of almost nine years and thousands of miles, Cabeza de Vaca, Castillo, Dorantes, and Estevanico, accompanied by a host of Indians, emerged from the wilderness naked, barefoot, and sunburned. Near Onavas, Mexico, the Spaniards see Indians being marched as slaves in chains, and the local Indians begin telling stories of the killing and enslaving of the indigenous peoples. These scenes repeat themselves. He wrote, With heavy hearts we looked out over the lavishly watered, fertile, and beautiful land, now abandoned and burned, and the people thin and weak, scattering or hiding in fright. Not having planted, they were reduced to eating roots and bark, and we shared their famine the whole way. Shortly after this episode, in March of 1536, Cabeza de Vaca encounters four Spaniards traveling through the country looking for Indians to capture. They stare at him in complete silence. They were dumbfounded at the sight of me, he wrote, strangely undressed and in company with Indians. They just stood, staring for a long time, not thinking to hail me or come closer to ask questions. Breaking the silence, Cabeza de Vaca says in perfect Castilian Spanish, Take me to your captain. He is led immediately to the local provincial leader. Cabeza de Vaca tells him in no uncertain terms to cease the slavery, the killing, and the pillaging. But the captain, staring at this hairy, naked, and emaciated Spaniard, is hardly willing to give up what he and his countrymen consider a highly profitable industry. A very loud argument ensues, and Cabeza de Vaca is arrested and sent in chains to the captain of the province. It's a fortunate event. He wrote, The Alcalde Mayor happened to know of the Narvaez expedition, and hearing now of our return from it, rushed that very night to where we were, and wept with us amid praises to God our Lord. The following day, they baptized the Indian children, and shortly thereafter, the Alcalde Mayor makes a solemn pledge never to enslave or subjugate the Indians again. While it would seem the fight against slavery in Mexico was won at that point, it wasn't. The governor of the region, a man named Guzman, was to be the largest hurdle. He fought viciously to continue the practice against both Cabeza de Vaca and the good Bishop Zumarraga, who had witnessed the miraculous tilma of Guadalupe. Bishop Zumarraga, under house arrest and harassed by Guzman's men, smuggles a note to the King of Spain in a wooden crucifix with a hidden chamber, alerting the King to the abuses that are occurring. Cabeza de Vaca, meanwhile, heads to Spain to make a case for the Indians, and after escaping from a pirate attack in the middle of the Atlantic, he safely arrives in Spain and alerts the king's court to the abuses taking place. Eventually, Governor Guzman is taken away in chains. He returns to Spain, but dies poor, desperately trying to find enough money simply to buy basic medicine for himself. Princess Pumpinson, meanwhile, converts and is baptized in 1524. Like Juan Diego, who witnessed the apparition of the Virgin Mary and was canonized a saint in 2002, she lives a life of exceptional virtue and is present to see the conversion of more than 8 million people during the first seven years after the apparitions at Guadalupe. It is the greatest mass conversion of any people to any faith or religion in the history of the world. Meanwhile, the Shrine of Guadalupe becomes the most visited religious shrine in the world, with 20 million visitors a year, followed today by St. Peter's in Rome, which receives 18 million. This is an amazing story of shipwrecks and slavery, of miracles, battles, apparitions, privations and hardship, spies and bribery, human sacrifice, and above all, an astonishing journey through a wilderness that took all but four lives out of 300. Those who sought to gain the most fared, and those who accepted their terrible fate ended up performing miracles. The darkness and misery of the four survivors perhaps came to be their greatest asset, for as St. John of the Cross wrote only decades after their ordeal, for someone to reach supernatural transformation, 
that person must be plunged into darkness. This story can best be summed up by the prophecy of the woman from Spain, who warned the conquistadors of the impending tragedies and misfortunes with their journey if they continued on their conquest. Cabezi de Vaca wrote later regarding Narvaez, the governor. She warned him, before he plunged inland not to go, that he, nor anyone with him, could ever escape, though should one get back, the Almighty would work great wonders for him. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation from Craig Turner. If this presentation has helped you in your faith journey, and you would like to hear more of these inspiring talks, we invite you to visit our website and enroll yourself or a friend in our CD or Download of the Month Club. Additionally, we encourage you to download the free Catholic Study Bible app produced by Lighthouse and Ignatius Press to your mobile device. This free app includes over 10 hours of insights from Dr. Scott Hahn, the entire Catholic Bible, and other amazing content and features. Lastly, as a listener, your input is very important to us in helping us to improve this program to reach many more souls for Christ and His Church. We would like to send you a free gift for your time when you complete a brief survey on the presentation you just heard. You'll find the survey at our website, www.lighthousecatholicmedia.org. Thanks for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family. The following presentation is distributed by Lighthouse Catholic Media, a not-for-profit corporation. To order additional copies of this presentation, browse our selection of over 300 inspiring titles in English and Spanish, make a tax-deductible